Hello and welcome. In this video, I wanted to take a look at the recent changes that the Adeptus Mechanicus have experienced with the new chapter approved, meaning we're going to be taking a look at the points changes, the data slate changes, as well as the secondaries for the Admech forces within this video. With that being said, I should give my overall view on the changes that have occurred and what I think about them. So to start off with, I think the changes are fine from a balance point of view in the sense of power level. However, I don't really like them as a whole, as I don't think they really address some of the core problems the Adeptus Mechanicus had, and I don't think they're going to promote diversity within list building. If anything, I think they're going to cut down on the diversity of army builds significantly, and I don't think they're necessarily going to make you want to play units that you weren't playing already, so that's a bit of a problem in that sense, and as we talk about them, kind of keep that in mind, and think about if the changes really encourage you to play your list differently, or if they're simply going to force you into one build, if that's going to be kind of homogenous across different players, especially with how the Forge Worlds have been affected by this. And I think that's very important to keep in mind, as it's very easy to say, well, now the power level of the Deptus Mechanicus is fine, everything should be okay, but I do think balance changes like this should address more of the overall army health, as opposed to simply giving them sort of one playable list, and that's going to be rather good. So that being said, let's start taking a look at the different changes. We'll start off by taking a look at the points changes. The points changes were rather minimal, and... I think a lot of people didn't really like them, so they're going to be rather quick to address. And we'll begin off by taking a look at the first points change, which was minus one point to each of the different Electro Priest types. I think this is kind of nice, and I think that's a good change, as Electro Priests were seeing very minimal play, if any, and I don't know if this is going to really encourage you to play them, as I think the problems they had are still very persistent. So you're going to kind of have to ask yourself, does it really matter if they lost one point each? I don't think it's going to really matter, and I don't really think they're going to be seeing a ton more play, but at least that's something they gave to a unit that wasn't very popular as it was. Now moving on, the next points change was minus two points to the Cerberus Raiders on each model. Yeah, this is probably right. The Cerberus Raiders were a little bit overcosted after their last points change, and I think dialing it back a little bit in terms of how much they cost is a good idea, as they kind of fell out of the meta after the last points bump, though I do think they were kind of seeing more and more play as time went on, so I don't think they were in dire need of it, but I think it's a good overall change as they probably needed a little bit of a tweak in that sense. The one thing I'll mention is I don't like the fact that they changed the Raiders but not the Sulphur Hounds. There's really no reason not to nerf the points on the Sulphur Hounds a tiny bit either, as just like the Raiders they see about as much play as they do, which means they're kind of a fringe unit and they're kind of not super in the meta though they still kind of pop up time to time. And the thing is while the Raiders do kind of have a unique role within the army, the Sulphur Hounds do compete very heavily with the Sterilizers, which is why they probably need a little more of a boost, as the Sterilizers do have a little bit more mobility than the Sulphur Hounds, which is a little bit of an awkward place for them to be, and I definitely think it's something they could have really addressed in this points change, although at the same time, maybe with the other points drops, they might see a little more play. I don't think they particularly will any more than they already had, simply because of the other changes that simply kind of discourage you from playing them a little bit, which is a bit unfortunate. And the final change that they made in points was dropping the points cost of each Rust Stalker by one point. This is fine, I guess, and Rust Stalkers were already kind of a powerful unit, so they did definitely help them out. And it's probably going to make most of the Admech lists out there a little bit cheaper, considering that they were running some number of Rust Stalkers. Though really, let's say you're running a unit of 10 of them, is gaining an extra 10 points really going to change how you play your list? Not really. Maybe if you're running 3 units of 10, which kind of is popular at this time, then you would end up with a 30 point savings, which is nice to say the least. But even then, that doesn't really change how you're going to build your army anyway. And while it's nice to have an already good unit get a little bit better, I do think the problem is, if you look at these three points changes, the points could have been reduced on some other units. I think the biggest unit that kind of lost out on this point reduction was the Scorpius tank, as the Scorpius tank is in a very dire place right now, and a lot of people used to run them. So it's kind of sad to see that that model is going to kind of end up sitting in people's collections and on the shelf for some time as all of the different changes including the global indirect fire changes really did hurt it a lot and i think it could have really used a big points drop just to make it a little more competitive and out of all of the units within the admet codex i think the scorpius disintegrator was definitely the one that needed the most help in regards to the points and while i don't really like normally just dropping points significantly because as admet are already kind of an expensive army in terms of dollar cost and simply reducing points just makes it that much harder to really build up an army, 
not only in terms of dollar cost, but also in terms of how much hobby time it takes a new player to build an ad mech army. So I do think that's something that they should use very sparingly. And I'm happy that they kind of look at the data slate more than just cutting points. But I do think the Scorpius tank really needed that kind of points cost. I think the people who already had it would have appreciated that as well, as it would have given them the opportunity to play it. Versus now, where a lot of people who already own one are probably going to end up having to shelve it and feeling a little bummed out about not being able to play one of the models they bought, especially considering it was included in a start collecting bundle previously. Anyway, that's kind of all my thoughts on the points changes. I don't think they were that bad, and I don't think they were particularly good either. I think they're kind of uh, whatever in terms of how they affect the army, and really most of the changes are going to come from data slate. The one last thing I'll say is don't take points changes within a vacuum, as the points reduction might be rather small in Admech. A lot of other armies that were top tier did see a pretty significant points increase, so those armies are going to be a bit worse, and that in turn makes Admech a little better. However, a lot of kind of middle of the pack armies did see big points drops, so they're probably going to be getting a little better, which might make Admech a little worse. So I do think that's going to be a little hard to say where they're going to end up. But I just wanted to say that kind of keep the entire context in mind because just because your army might have not changed, the fact that other armies did change and that in turn changes the meta is going to change how your army performs, regardless if it saw any changes in itself simply because the meta changes around it and different armies play differently in different metas. So that's just very important to keep in mind. So with the points changes covered, let's take a look at the data slate changes. The data slate changes are mostly reversions of prior changes, which I think is actually a rather good thing because now you have less things to keep track of and you can play more out of your codex without ending up in some of those weird situations where you're playing against a newer player and they might not be aware that something might have been FAQ'd, so they end up playing the Codex version, which just doesn't work anymore, and then it's a whole thing about how you have to explain, hey, there's this data file online that you have to reference now to know how your abilities work, and just as a whole, it kind of makes buying the Codex feel a little less worse, because now more of your rules are within the Codex, and that's always a good thing. And as a whole, reducing the amount of paperwork you have to kind of keep track of is always beneficial, so being able to remove additional FAQs to increase the power level of an army is definitely a good thing, and definitely makes things a little easier, so I'm definitely all for it. With that being said, the time I'm recording this, the actual FAQ still says a lot of these things are in place, though an article written on the Games Workshop website does suggest that this is intentional, and these things have been removed from the data slate, so it's most likely going to be updated when the FAQ gets updated. However, at this time it's still there, so if something changes between now and when that happens, do keep in mind that this video was made before they changed anything in the FAQ, and there's still a little bit of potential of some of this being changed down the line. Anyway, the first data slate change that they made was the Iron Strider Bellastari and the Sidonian Dragoons have regained their core keyword. This is actually a rather big change, as all of a sudden they can benefit from a variety of different abilities, such as, let's say, rerolls from the Exemplar's Eternity on a Skitari Marshal, or something like the Raiments of the Techno Martyr, which makes them more accurate. They can also benefit from all the different Skitari Warlord traits, as well as a lot of durability traits, such as the Luminescent Blessing Warlord trait for the Lucius Forge World, which will definitely make them a lot more durable. And that's a nice thing to have, because, well, even though they have a lot of very powerful output, they do have a little bit of an issue with durability sometimes. So increasing their ability to survive through things like the Holy Order of the Low Guy or something like the Luminescent Blessing does help a lot. However, I think this begins to kind of show the first issues with some of these changes in that all of a sudden you're kind of being pushed towards one Forge World being the Lucius Forge World as they're the only ones who have something like Luminescent Blessing. And we'll see further down how certain other changes do push you more towards Lucius as well. And I think that kind of shows some of the issues with kind of reverting those changes as all of a sudden you're kind of being pushed in this one direction. The other issue I think is, is that something like the Scorpius tank is definitely not seeing any play now because the Bellastari Iron Strider has gotten so much better with the addition of that core keyword that there really isn't any reason outside of maybe competition within the unit type of the fast attack slot being so crowded that you would play something else. Though I think now you're just kind of pushed into kind of including Iron Striders and not really considering other choices for damage output. And that kind of also reduces the variety that you'll see in different lists. However, I do think in terms of power level, this is a very good change. And I think this will kind of make the Iron Striders a lot more prevalent as they were kind of falling out of the meta. Additionally, I think giving core to their Dragoons is really cool. And 
does make them better. I don't think they should have ever lost Core to begin with, though I think that was just a consistency thing that Games Workshop did. In any case, I do like this change in terms of power, but not necessarily in terms of healthy list building. Anyway, the next change is to two different stratagems, and both these stratagems basically lost a restriction on how often you can use them, those stratagems being clandestine infiltration and acquisition at any cost. And this is nice because before you could only use infiltration twice and acquisition only once. And this now lets you kind of use them a little more, so you can definitely make much more use of them. However, do keep in mind that the command point changes for pregame spending for things like clandestine infiltration have been reduced significantly, so you're going to have a much harder time using it anyway. Though on the other hand, because you're now gaining more command points throughout the turns, you're going to have a little easier of a time using acquisition at any cost, and being able to automatically pass morale so you don't lose more models within large blocks of Skitari is definitely a very good thing to have, and I think that's going to contribute to the power of the Admech forces as well. However, this once again kind of primarily benefits large blobs of Skitari, so it's definitely going to push you in that direction as well. And I think that's going to kind of push some things like Catafrons a little bit out of the meadow, which they were just kind of coming back into. So it's a little bit sad to see that they're going to be kind of forced out of the meta. However, this is a good change overall. And I think it's something that lets you play your army list more efficiently and benefits from kind of the command point changes in some ways in that way as well. Now the fourth change is, is that Galvanic Volley has been restored to its original state. So now it reads like the Codex once again going to rapid fire instead of heavy 3 when used on your ranger units. This is kind of more of a side grade than an upgrade necessarily, because being able to go to heavy 3 at the full range of the ranger's galvanic rifle is definitely a very nice feeling, though when you're within half range you're going to get double the shots which means you'll have 4 shots instead of 3, and in addition to that you can use this stratagem in certain ways to mitigate some of the negatives of having a heavy weapon. Though one thing I'll say is I think this is probably the worst change in terms of a variety of list building. Whereas Luminescent Blessing is a powerful ability, it's kind of limited in terms of what it does because your opponent can always choose to kind of ignore the unit that's benefited by it and focus on other units within your army. And generally that's going to be the case with defensive abilities as defensive abilities are generally going to give your opponent more ability to counterplay them, whereas offensive abilities give you the ability to counterplay your opponent. And the reason I'm saying this is because the Heavy 3 version of it didn't require to get within close range of your enemy with a unit of rangers. You could kind of use it with pretty much any forge world and be perfectly fine because of that 30 inch range. However, when you want to be within half range of your enemy unit, you're going to be benefited very, very heavily by being in a forge world like Lucius with the Solar Flare so that you can pick up a unit and then drop it down near an enemy unit and just basically wipe them off the table with Rapid Fire 2 using Galvanic Volley. And the problem with this is, is not just this, but think about it this way. Luminescent Blessing is within Lucius, and Solar Flare is within Lucius as well. So why would you really play any other Forge World? And this is kind of coming at a time when we start to see things like Rise of Pop up and other Forge Worlds kind of starting to find a home. Not only that, but we're seeing things like the Chaos on Robots who definitely also very heavily benefit from Solar Flare. And if you have to choose between a unit of 20 Rangers or a unit of Chaos on Robots, you probably are going to side a little more with the Rangers, especially now that the Skitari Veteran Cohort has gone so much better with the changes to the Iron Striders, as well to the different stratagems that have been reverted to kind of their original state, that you're probably going to see much less Castle and Robots who are finally showing up within the meta, and you're probably going to see a lot more Veteran Cohorts versus things like the Defense Cohort, which was actually finally starting to see play as well, and you're probably not going to see a lot of the other Forge Worlds for a very long time. So that's kind of my problem with this whole thing is, once again, from a power standpoint, this isn't a bad change, but from kind of pushing you into a specific forge world and a specific army type, this definitely is going to make list building a lot more homogenous, and it's going to give you a lot less reason to play some of those other units within the Codex, such as the Cult Mechanicus units, and I think that's kind of a very big miss for Games Workshop. But before I get too much into these changes, even though I just talked about them for quite some time in kind of an abstract way, let's take a look at the other stratagem that was changed, which was Enriched Rounds. Enriched Rounds was changed to remove the variance within the command point cost, and now just cost the static amount of command points regardless of what unit you use it on. The one thing to keep in mind is that it still only auto wounds on a 5 plus and not a 4 plus, like in its original incarnation within the Codex. So you do have to keep that in mind, and it's not quite as good as it once was before, but it's definitely better now, and you, you do have that choice between Rangers and Vanguard, and really you're probably going to want a unit of each within an army, as then it gives you the most access to these two different stratagems and which unit you decide to solar flare near your enemy unit and pretty much wipe off the board within one turn. 
so it's not so much a choice between Rangers only or Vanguard only. Although I do think Rangers are a little bit better still. The, the Vanguard are still fine, and the stratagem definitely helps their power level a little bit in that sense. But once again, this change does kind of push you towards that Skitari build, and it does push you more towards those large blocks of Skitari. So I don't really want to disparage this change, because I do think at least you get the variety of Rangers and Vanguard within a single list. I do want to say that you're pretty much going to start seeing lists that are basically Rangers, Vanguard, Iron Striders, and then some number of Rust Stalkers and Sterilizers, with probably not too much other units within it. You'll see maybe a handful of other units within lists, but that's pretty much going to be what you're building out of your Codex, is those four units and then whatever HQ choices you decide to include. And I don't know, I don't, I don't really like that too much, but I guess it's better than having kind of a nerfed army, so that's something good there. Outside of that, there are a few things that this data slate didn't address, and I think one of the biggest ones is the reduction in starting command points, because Admech are very intensive in terms of spending when they build an army list and take different warlord traits and relics, and now you don't even get the free ones. So there is a little bit of a problem that you're going to be very tight in command points, and you're going to have a very hard time fitting in all of your different relics and traits, and that's not necessarily a fun place to be, because you're going to feel a lot of friction when building your list, and I think that's something they really needed to address within this data slate because the change really impacts how you would want to build an admec list. And fortunately, we don't really get that within this data slate change. And I think that's also going to hurt the ability for a lot of the different Forge worlds that have pre-game spending stratagems, such as Agrippina, where you spend those command points on something like indentured machines. And now I don't think that's even going to be viable at all, which once again reduces the playability of Cataphrons, which is kind of sad, and reduces the playability of different Forge worlds. Because sure, you uncap the amount of times you can use clandestine infiltration, but why would I really want to play any Forge World other than Lucius? And that's the other thing is, you've limited the number of flyers you can use, though I think those are going to show up in lists still, but you also kind of made the Scorpius tank unusable, so you reduced the diversity of lists that previously saw play when Admech first came out, and other point changes did still kind of hurt them. I think you might still see some castle and robots, as the point changes to them do make them kind of attractive, but I think the problem is you kind of want to play the veteran cohort as well because of these changes. So you probably will see less castles overall. Though I think they'll sneak into the meta and maybe take the place of what the Scorpius used to be. Though they might not also see much play either if people are just going towards the veteran cohort. And one other thing to point out though is that something like Luminescent Blessing and Low Guy and Solar Flare all benefited the castle robots pretty heavily. So switching those back to Iron Striders and using them on large Skitari Ranger blocks does hurt the castle and robots indirectly, and I think that's also going to really hurt their playability. Ultimately, something like the defense cohort hasn't gotten any worse outside of the command point changes, but it definitely hasn't gotten any better, and I don't think you're going to see it quite as much as you saw it for a short while there, and I don't think the variety of units within lists is going to change at all either. So that's kind of my different gripes. Definitely Admech is better than it was before these changes, although I don't think it's going to be as good as it was when it came out, as not only are your flyers more limited, but you don't have the indirect fire of the Scorpius anymore necessarily, and Iron Striders are a little more expensive, but also all of the other armies that have come out since that are pretty solid, and all the other changes to all of the other armies. I do think Admech are going to be a lot more middle of the pack than would first seem compared to how dominant they were when they were first released. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think they're going to be okay, and I think they're going to be a lot more viable than they were for the last three months or so. But I do think they could have maybe done more to kind of encourage using different Forge Worlds and encourage using different units. If you want, you can kind of check out the video I put out last week, which was how I would fix Adeptus Mechanicus. And while I don't think that's the only way you could fix Adeptus Mechanicus, I think it takes a better approach in terms of making more units in Forge Worlds playable than this approach does. But this approach definitely does have a lot of simplicity to it, and I don't think it's necessarily bad. So don't take this as necessarily me hating on this. It's just, I think there are some issues that need to be kind of pointed out, and I think those issues can be kind of a little dissuaging to certain players, especially players who want to play certain units within the Admech forces. But ultimately, I think these are positive changes, outside of the fact that they're going to reduce some of that variety in list building. But I guess that's kind of unavoidable if they just want to bring Admech up to a kind of a very strong standpoint where they were before all of the different changes and they wanted to make it as simple as possible, I think this is kind of the best approach they could have taken if they didn't want to add a whole bunch of text to the data slate. So with all of that out of the way, let's take a look at the secondaries for the Adeptus Mechanicus forces. I don't have the book yet when I'm recording this, so I'm kind of going off of what I've heard from other sources. So if something's wrong, do keep that in mind. Then I'm doing my best to kind of get everything correct based on a variety of different sources. 
And if I did get something wrong, do let me know in the comments down below. But I'll do my best to kind of get everything as right as I can with the limited information that I do have. So that being said, the Adeptus Mechanicus have four different faction-specific secondaries. And the first of those secondaries is Accretion of Knowledge, which doesn't seem to have really changed since the last chapter approved. And basically what it says is you score three victory points for each destroyed enemy that meets one of the following criteria. It had a warlord trait, a relic, or it's a vehicle that has a wound characteristic of 14 or more. And all I have to really kind of say about this is this is a really weird secondary, especially with the command point changes and the changes that you no longer get a free relic and a free trait. So this is going to be incredibly limited in terms of its usage, as you're only really going to use it if your opponent, for whatever reason, maxed out on warlord traits and relics, which means you're probably going to really only use it against other Adeptus Mechanicus forces that still want to make use of those relics and warlord traits. Or are you going to use this against something like knights, where they have those big vehicles with a ton of wounds, and you can score the points just by taking out some of those big knights. Though really, I think the secondary is very weak, and I think it's been hurt incredibly heavily by the command point changes, as well as the trait and relic changes. So I don't think it's one that you're really going to ever use, except for incredibly specific situations. Though like I said, there might be some of those, especially with how popular knights are. So do keep it in mind, but really kind of don't consider it unless you're in a situation where it's very obvious that you can get at least 9 to 12 points off it. Now the second secondary that the Adeptus Mechanicus have is called Eradication of Flesh. And Eradication of Flesh says you score 3 points in a turn you destroyed more enemy units with vehicles than you lost vehicles within that battle round. This has been changed quite significantly. As before, basically all you had to do was destroy infantry units with any of your units and you just had to have vehicles alive on the battlefield essentially. So essentially it encouraged kind of a really weird level of play where you could take a vehicle, hide it somewhere in the corner, and just start picking off enemy units with whatever else. So it was kind of a very weird style of play in terms of wanting to use vehicles where in fact maybe it even discouraged you from having vehicles in your list. Whereas now it really pushes you towards having vehicles. That being said, The problem is the Adeptus Mechanicus vehicles are just not that impressive, and they're not that impressive for what you want to do with this kind of secondary. Though on the other hand, the Iron Striders are definitely better now, and the Castlins are still usable, as well as the Stratoraptor and Fuselave, so you do have some options in that sense, and you can even maybe use something like Dragoons. However, the problem is, is the following. Those vehicles for the most part have a very limited number of shots, and the Castlins do have to kind of be within melee. Whereas the Adeptus Mechanicus playstyle is pushing you towards those large blocks of infantry, such as using large units of Rust Stalkers, of Rangers, and Vanguard. So it's kind of weird that's pushing you in the direction of vehicles. But not only that, but the vehicles in the Adeptus Mechanicus forces are kind of fragile, so your opponent can focus them down and take them out rather easily if they're in the wrong position, which does kind of hamper you there as well. Though with the core being restored on the Iron Striders, you do have access to some of those resilience benefits. Sort of like the Lucius Luminescent Blessing or the Little Guy Holy Order. But the other problem is, is the Iron Striders don't have that many shots. Even a unit of four of them has two shots per Iron Strider, meaning that you're getting eight last cannon shots, which is very impressive. But the problem is, is if your opponent has kind of larger units, you're going to struggle taking out a unit every single turn. So you do have to be very aware of what units you can take out every single turn and how many of them you can take out because your opponent can also counterplay this very easily by taking out your vehicles. Though if you do have larger vehicle units, such as larger units of Iron Striders, you do get benefited in that way, because they have to destroy more vehicle units, not just individual vehicles. So there is kind of that optionality. But once again, you're also kind of in that situation where, okay, you take a Dune Crawler, and your Dune Crawler is going to only put out so many shots, whereas your opponent can really focus down that single individual Dune Crawler, and that's an entire unit in itself. The same goes for a lot of the other vehicles, which are kind of a little fragile, though maybe in something like a data horde where you get that 6 plus feel no pain and you're kind of encouraged to bring some vehicles, you can maybe do something with that. I don't think this is a bad secondary. I think it's definitely more usable than the accretion of knowledge secondary we just took a look at. So there's definitely going to be situations where you do want to make use of this. It's just you kind of have to ask yourself how many units can you take out in a turn of your opponent's army and how easily can they take out your vehicles and if you think they have small enough units that some of your heavy firepower from your vehicles can take them out rather consistently you definitely want to consider the secondary as an option as there are going to be situations where you're going to get a pretty good scoring on this one and don't forget one other thing is just because you can't get the full 15 points doesn't make it a bad secondary anymore as it looks like a lot of the secondaries will have a much harder time within the new chapter approved of scoring the full 15 points 
So being able to get 9 to 12 victory points on a secondary is very good, and I think in the right armies, this can definitely score that many. Though once again, it comes down to how you build your army, and it comes down to what your opponent is playing. So you do have to be very aware of those things going into a matchup. The third secondary objective is called Uncharted Sequence. And Uncharted Sequence is basically where you assign a battle round to each of the objectives on the battlefield, and then at the end of the battle round that they're assigned to, you score three points if you control that objective at the end of that battle round. The change that this one received, according to everything I've read, is that you now assign the target objectives after you know who's going first, instead of before deployment like it was within the previous chapter approved. This means you can really target the objectives a lot better in terms of when you're going to push for them, so you have a much better idea of where your opponent is starting out and where your forces are starting out, so that you can assign the first few objectives in such a way that you can get them very successfully, instead of kind of just hoping that your opponent doesn't deploy close to an objective that you put on, let's say, battle round number two or number three, and then being kind of trapped out of it. Though you're still going to have some difficulty of getting maybe some of the backfield objectives that are in your opponent's deployment zone. Though outside of this, I think this is kind of an interesting one, as it does kind of promote what you want to be doing already, which is controlling objectives. And if you think you have a pretty good chance of being able to sit on an objective and control it, this is definitely a good option to have. Maybe it can even encourage more play of the defense cohort. And I do think the change in the new chapter approved in terms of when you assign the battle rounds to the objectives definitely makes it a better secondary for you. And I do like it. So once again, comes down to the matchup, comes down to what your, what your opponent is playing. But I do think this one is kind of interesting, and I think there's a lot of potential in this secondary. I definitely think it's better for builds that want to take objectives and sit on them very heavily, and it might be a little hard to use against certain armies that have really good abilities to deny objectives for you. So once again, your opponent does have a lot of ability to counterplay you, but their ability to counterplay you is a little bit reduced based on when you assign the rounds to objectives. So this one is definitely one you can definitely play around with. It's not a bad option if you think you can get it, and once again, you're probably going to be able to at least get 9 points off of it, Unless something goes catastrophically wrong and your opponent just wipes you off the table before you even have a chance to kind of really get into the game. And one other thing to keep in mind is acquisition at any cost does make this better as well. And finally, the fourth and final secondary objective is Hidden Archeo Vault. And what the secondary is, is your opponent selects an objective marker that isn't in their deployment zone, and you score four points for each round that you control that objective. The change that this one has seen is that previously it would be that you score 2 points a turn for holding that objective, and then 5 points if you're still holding that objective at the end of the game. This definitely makes it a little more consistent in terms of how you'll be gaining those victory points, so I do like that change, and what's probably going to happen is your opponent is going to assign this to one of the middle objectives, because it can't be within their deployment zone, and they're definitely not going to give it to you on one of your objectives that's in your deployment zone, unless they think they can really take it from you. So essentially you're going to be fighting for the objective in the middle of the map. So if you think you can take an old objective specifically, it's definitely a good option to pick. And I think there's going to be situations where you definitely want this secondary objective. As sometimes you're just going to be able to go onto an objective and hold it for the duration of the game. Even if you just hold it for the first three battle rounds, you've done very well. Though Admec isn't necessarily a melee focused army. So against melee opponents, they're probably going to be able to kind of push you and bully you off that objective. Although at the same time, if you have something like a unit of Castellans, you can definitely plop them down and they're going to be pretty good at holding that objective from any range firepower. And Anmec does have a lot of ways of screening different positions. So they can definitely find ways of kind of holding an objective and preventing the opponent from kind of being able to really collapse easily on top of that objective, which does make it a nice option in those situations. And I think this is one that if you can kind of get very good at accomplishing, it's definitely going to serve you very well. But do keep in mind that if your opponent can bully you off that objective, they can pretty much deny you almost all the points. And you can no longer kind of do that thing where you kind of wait till the end of the game and then capture it in the last minute to score 5 points for holding it at the end of the game and 2 points for holding it that battle round. So it's definitely kind of harder to do that boom bust kind of thing with it. But the consistency also lets you kind of score points on it very well and very efficiently. And to kind of wrap up this video, I don't think any of these secondary objectives are particularly obvious. And I think they're all kind of okay in certain situations, except for the first one, which is okay in only very, very specific situations. So I think for the most part, you're going to have to kind of decide every single game based on what you see your opponent bring into a table on which one of these is going to serve you the best. And I think there's going to be a lot of situations where if you don't build your army to actually do one of these objectives, you can really easily be locked out of one of these secondary objectives, which does kind of hurt, considering that some other armies have some nice secondary objectives. 
And it's kind of sad to see that they didn't really address the accretion of knowledge ability, considering how much more rare relics and warlord traits are going to become. So I do think there's a little bit of a missed opportunity in that sense. And to kind of wrap up what I think of chapter approved Nephilim overall for the Adeptus Mechanicus is I think it's fine in terms of a power level sort of thing. And I think it does help the Admech out, but I do think it has a lot of problems that I didn't really address. So overall, I think it's positive enough. But there is that kind of lingering issue of list building diversity and being able to kind of play with some of the different models within the faction. So I do think that kind of makes me a little more bummed out about it than I would otherwise be. But again, if you like the units that are playable and you enjoy playing those units, you're going to have a really fun time and you're going to have a lot of nice new little toys to play with. And to be fair, Lucius is not a bad Forge world to be stuck in, considering how many fun toys it has. But it's just kind of sad that there's such a big winner of this codex, simply because of all of the abilities that they have being so powerful compared to other Forge worlds. And I think the biggest other issue is not addressing the command point changes, because I think that's really going to hurt Admec. And as we saw with the first secondary that we looked at, Accretion of Knowledge, they really didn't consider how it's going to impact Admec. Not only in terms of list building, where almost every single admec list at this point is going to have to cut back on some of their traits and relics, because otherwise it would start with negative command points, and that's on a legal list. But also it does make some of the Forge Worlds that had stratagems that encourage you to pregame spend a little worse, and it makes some of the supplements a little worse. And it also makes the secondary for the admec a little worse. So that would be the biggest thing I think they overlook in terms of how the admec play, and in terms of how a global rule changes how they play. And that's been kind of what hit Admech the most in all these different changes lately, is all the global changes, because Admech has a lot of minus one AP weapons. So Armor of Contempt really does hit them harder than a lot of other armies, and Indirect Fire really hit their Scorpius tank, which was a very popular option and isn't necessarily playable without that Indirect Fire, unlike the Plague Burst Crawler within the Death Guard forces, for example. And then the Flyer Rule really hit the Flyers of Admech, obviously, as for a while their best list was using something like six different flyers. So I do kind of want Games Workshop to take a more holistic approach to how they maybe look at Admech, and I think maybe they're overlooking some things in that sense. But again, I think the chapter approved changes are positive overall, but I do think there are a few little things they could have maybe done a little better. And I'll continue looking at different factions that I've covered throughout this week and next week, and see how they've been affected by some of these changes as well. And maybe they'll change some of my opinions, but I do think my overall view of it is it's a good attempt in many ways. I do wish they kind of did a little more. But the biggest thing I'll say is the points changes are now online and the data slate is still available. So I do think they have a lot more opportunity to kind of adjust those points and dial them in for some of the units that might not see play. So I do think that's the biggest positive overall is them moving more towards an online situation where they can kind of adjust things more gradually and more successfully as time goes on instead of just being kind of stuck to a six-month printing cycle. Anyways, as always, thank you for watching, and as always, I want to give a big shout-out to my patrons. You guys are really awesome people and really do help support the channel. In addition to that, I would like to say, if you know anyone who may benefit from this content, please do share this video with them, as it not only helps the channel, but it also helps them out as well. And if you've enjoyed the content, do subscribe and like for future videos from this channel. Thank you for watching and have a great day. Bye.